This program will discuss the general safety and health hazards associated with welding and cutting and examine hazards and controls specific to oxyfuel gas welding, cutting and arc welding. The hazards associated with welding and cutting arise from toxic gases and fumes, radiation, electrical circuits, and flammable and combustible materials. Chemical agents commonly encountered in welding include the fumes of nickel, zinc, iron oxide, copper, cadmium, fluorides, manganese, and chromium and gases such as carbon monoxide, oxides of nitrogen and ozone. Physical agents include visible infrared and ultraviolet radiation, noise, vibration, thermal energy, and electrical energy. Fumes generated during welding and cutting operations may arise from the base metal being worked on, from coatings previously applied to the base metal, from the flux present, or from the filler metal being used. Other than fumes, other solid materials, such as fluxes and filler metal, may enter the air as fugitive dusts. Mineral and metal dusts may also be produced. Fumes may produce a variety of effects. For instance, metal fume fever is an acute disease of short duration caused by the inhalation of metal oxide fumes, such as zinc, copper, and magnesium. Symptoms include respiratory disturbances resembling an infection, influenza, fever, acute bronchitis, pneumonia. Chills, shivering, trembling, nausea, and vomiting may also occur. These symptoms most frequently occur after the first exposure following a period of relief, such as a Monday after a weekend off. In addition, welders exposed to fumes containing such substances as iron, chromium, chromates, lead, and aluminum may suffer damage to the lungs, lung cancer, possible nervous system problems, and irritation to the eyes, nose, throat, and lungs. Injuries to the eye occur when eye protection is either not properly worn or not worn at all to protect against the electrical welding arc. These injuries include keratitis, penetration, and retinal injury, such as welder's flesh. Exposure of the skin to ultraviolet radiation from welding and cutting can result in a skin burn resembling a severe sunburn. Chronic dermatosis may also result from welding torch radiation. Hearing loss may be suffered due to hazardous noise levels or traumatic injury to the ear caused by flying metal. Another hazard resulting from welding and cutting is reduced muscle power and pain in the shoulders. These are caused by static and often distorted postures adopted during welding operations. The fire hazards caused by welding and cutting are due either to the direct flame or to flying sparks and molten metal. Explosions may be caused when welding sparks ignite flammable or explosive materials. An oxyfuel gas welding process unites metals by heating them with the flame from the combustion of a fuel gas or gases. Sometimes the process includes the use of pressure and a filler metal. It's hard to believe that something as vital to life as oxygen can be a deadly hazard as well. But in fact, it can be. The presence of oxygen is required to support any burning process. Oxygen must be combined with a fuel gas to produce the desired operating flame. Oxygen itself is not flammable or explosive. However, the presence of pure oxygen dramatically increases the speed and force with which burning takes place. Combustible materials burn much more rapidly in pure oxygen than in air. Oxygen also forms explosive mixtures in certain proportions with acetylene and other flammable gases. However, this hazard can be controlled. This oxygen cylinder has been labeled with its proper name, oxygen. Oxygen cylinders must never be labeled air. Serious injury may result if oxygen is used as a substitute for compressed air, such as for purging hazardous atmospheres. Oxygen is ordinarily supplied in standard drawn steel cylinders. The amount of oxygen remaining in the cylinder can be determined by reading the cylinder pressure gauge on the regulator when in use. The maximum charging pressure is always stamped on the cylinder. In oxygen cylinders, there is as much as 2,600 pounds per square inch, PSIG pressure. When the pressure is released from the cylinder through the regulator, the speed at which the oxygen travels exceeds the speed of sound and heat and friction are generated. Oil and grease become highly explosive when mixed with oxygen. Acetylene is another hazardous gas used in gas welding. Acetylene is a combination of carbon and hydrogen. 
Serious accidents can result from the misuse and mishandling of compressed gas cylinders. Compressed gas cylinders should be legibly marked with either the chemical or the trade name of the gas. Whenever practical, the marking shall be located on the shoulder of the cylinder. These cylinders have been properly marked. Only cylinders carrying the approval of the U.S. Department of Transportation shall be used. Cylinders may be moved by tilting and rolling them on their bottom edges, but it is best to secure them in a suitable cart. OSHA stipulates that cylinders shall not be dragged, dropped, or struck, or permitted to strike each other violently. These valve protection caps are designed to protect valves from damage and to avoid an unguided missile in case of knocking off the unprotected valve. They are required on all cylinders with a watertight capacity of over 30 pounds. They are not to be used for lifting cylinders from one place to another. Empty cylinders should be marked with the word empty and separated from full cylinders to avoid confusion. Empties should be returned to the supplier as soon as possible. When gas cylinders are used, the special T-wrench or key for opening or closing the cylinder valve must always be in position for use so that the gas can be turned off quickly in an emergency. OSHA standards stipulate that acetylene cylinder valves shall not be opened more than one and one-half turns and preferably not more than three-quarters of a turn. Pressure gauges should be tested periodically for accuracy by a competent welding engineer. If the gauges have been strained so that the hands do not register properly, the regulator must be replaced or repaired before it is used again. If a regulator creeps, the cylinder should be closed and the regulator removed for repairs. Creeping is indicated by a gradual increase in the pressure after the torch valves are closed. The reverse flow check valve on the regulator and torch handle reduces the possibility of the formation of mixed gases, which will burn rapidly and can explode in the hoses, regulators, or cylinders. Oxygen and acetylene hoses shall be color-coded to prevent confusion. According to American National Standards Institute, the generally recognized colors are red for fuel gas hose, green for oxygen hose, and black for inert gas and air hose. The welder should always verify proper connections before starting work. Standard hose connections are threaded right hand for oxygen and left hand for acetylene or other fuel gas. This helps prevent an accidental switch of oxygen and fuel gas hoses. Oxygen and fuel gas hoses are not to be used interchangeably. A single hose with more than one gas passage should not be used. Arc welding creates problems of its own. Arc welding is a group of processes which produces coalescence of metals by heating them with an arc, with or without the application of pressure, and with or without the use of filler material. Arc cutting is a generic term for carbon arc cutting, gas metal arc cutting, gas tungsten arc cutting, metal arc cutting, plasma arc cutting, shielded metal arc cutting, oxygen cutting, especially useful for metals that do not oxidize readily, and air carbon arc cutting. The principal hazards presented by arc welding are intense ultraviolet visible and infrared radiation, production of toxic gases such as ozone, nitrogen oxides and carbon monoxide, action of ultraviolet rays and thermal decomposition on chlorinated hydrocarbon vapors, production of toxic fumes from melting toxic metals or metal alloy, splatter of molten metal, mishandling high-pressure gas in cylinders and manifolds, and electrical shock. Ultraviolet radiation is produced in arc welding when using shielding gas. Arc welding operations should be isolated so that other workers will not be exposed to either direct or reflected rays. Walls, ceilings, and other exposed inner surfaces should be painted with a finish of low reflectivity, such as zinc oxide or lamp black. Arc welding stations for regular production work can be enclosed in booths, if the size of the work permits this. The inside of the booth should be provided with portable non-combustible or flame-resistant screens or curtains. Booths and screens shall permit circulation of air at floor level. For many welding and cutting operations, control of gases and fumes by dilution ventilation is sufficient. 
That is, enough fresh air can be added to the contaminated air to prevent a hazardous buildup of toxic chemicals. However, the effectiveness of dilution ventilation depends on several factors. The size of the space in which welding or cutting is done, the total number of welders working within the space, the hazardous chemical or physical agents produced by the welding or cutting. Arc welding is done with either a metallic or a carbon electrode. For gas metal arc welding, the electrode is a solid or flux cord wire. For shielded metal arc welding, the electrode is a covered wire. The electrode holder consists of an insulated handle and a clamping device for holding the electrode. The electrode can be gripped firmly at any angle and held in that position. A fully insulated electrode holder reduces the likelihood of accidentally striking an arc. Connections between the cable and the holder must be checked to be certain they are not loose. The jaws of the electrode holder should be maintained tight and the gripping surface is in good condition to provide close contact with the electrodes. Defective jaws will permit the electrode to wobble and will render control of the welding operations difficult, causing overheating and arcing. The connection of the electrode lead to the holder should be either soldered or brazed. When welding is to be interrupted for any substantial period of time, such as during lunch or overnight, OSHA requires that the machine be disconnected from the power source, that all electrodes be removed from the holders, and that the holders be carefully placed so that accidental contact cannot occur. When changing electrodes, the worker must be on a dry surface and wear gloves. When not in use, the electrode holder must never be left in contact with the tabletop or other metallic surfaces which are in direct contact with the welding ground. An insulated hook or holder should be provided for the electrode holder when not in use. The holder in contact with the ground circuit causes a dead short circuit on the welding generator. Should the machine be started up, this short circuit would cause an excessive load on the motor and could damage the insulation and fuses. Because of the hazards created by welding and cutting operations, great care shall be taken in determining work sites so that they do not create fire hazards or endanger workers nearby. Because of the potential for fire and explosion, OSHA lists four locations where cutting or welding shall not be permitted. One, in the presence of explosive atmospheres, mixtures of flammable gases, vapors, liquids, or dusts with air. Two, in areas near the storage of large quantities of exposed, readily ignitable materials. Three, in sprinklered buildings while such protection is impaired. Four, in areas not authorized by management. It is good practice to provide each welding booth with a Class B and C fire extinguisher of a dry chemical, multipurpose, or carbon dioxide type. According to OSHA standards, cutting or welding shall be permitted only in areas that are or have been made fire safe. Training should be given to all workers on the hazards in welding and cutting operations. The training should be specific to the type of operation, location, and kinds of materials that are to be cut or welded. The training should include hazard recognition, hazard evaluation, and hazard control. Training in the care and use of personal protective clothing and equipment is necessary for the safety and health of the worker. Training should include fire protection and safe work practices. The general safety and health hazards arising from welding and cutting operations result from a number of conditions and affect workers in a number of ways. This program has described some of the hazards and methods to control them. Utilization of control measures suggested in this presentation will aid in the reduction of workplace hazards associated with welding. Conscientious practice of the control measures described and strict adherence to the standards can reduce dramatically the number and severity of accidents and illnesses resulting from welding and cutting hazards. This program will discuss oxyacetylene welding and burning equipment and its safe use. Although it is not possible to cover every possible safety hazard, some of the most common mistakes made when using oxyacetylene equipment will be explained. 
It really doesn't matter what brand of equipment you use. The dangers are the same. If you have a question about any special equipment or need specific information on the operation of equipment in your plant, check with your supervisor or team leader. The purpose of this program is to develop a better understanding of safety practices required when using gas welding, cutting, and heating equipment. If you don't follow the rules, even a standard regulator can become a killer. For example, a regulator like this one killed a man in Charlotte, North Carolina. It wasn't the regulator's fault. If the man had known and practiced what you will know after viewing this program, he would be alive today. So watch carefully. Your life may depend on it. There are 10 basic safety rules developed by welding engineers which should be practiced when using oxyacetylene equipment. Rule number one, blow out the cylinder valves before attaching the regulators to the cylinders. Since many people call a gas cylinder a tank, the two terms will be used interchangeably. Start with the oxygen cylinder. Look at the valve. Inspect it. See if it's got dirt, rust, lubricant, grease, or whatever in it. Some people believe that grease on the threads will help the regulator screw on easier. But the truth is, there should never be any grease or oil anywhere near pure oxygen. And that applies to grease or oil contaminated gloves or rags, too. While oxygen itself won't burn, it will support combustion. Here's a demonstration that will help you understand. The air we breathe is 22% oxygen. If you light a candle and put a jar over it, it will shortly go out. The reason is the candle uses up the oxygen as it burns until there is only about 16% left, at which point the candle goes out. If you were small enough to get in the jar, you would die because 16% oxygen won't support life. The oxygen in this tank is about 99.5% pure we'll fill up the jar with it. Now we'll put it over the candle and you see how much more brightly the candle burns in oxygen. Oxygen doesn't burn but it sure does support combustion. Oil or grease on the oxygen valve may start a fire when the valve is cracked to blow it out. This can occur without a spark or flame because grease or oil in the presence of oxygen will start spontaneous combustion which means it will start burning all by itself. So inspect the valve carefully. Now move to a position so that the opening is pointing away from you. Then crack the valve for about a second to blow out any dust, rust, etc., which could cause the regulator to fail to work properly. Check the valve again to be sure it is clear. If it is, mount the oxygen regulator. Rule number two, release the adjusting screws on the regulators before opening up the cylinder valve. This means you turn the handle counterclockwise to screw it out until there is no pressure on the diaphragm. What this does is to shut off the regulator so that the high pressure which is in the tank can't go into the working mechanism of the regulator or beyond it. Rule number three, stand to one side of the regulator before opening the cylinder valve. The weakest point of a regulator is the bonnet. If a regulator explodes, it usually is the bonnet that goes first. When it does, the adjusting screw is blown out. If you're right there, it's about the same as standing in front of a discharging 30 6 rifle. Rule number four, open the cylinder valve slowly. The pressure in a full tank of oxygen is 2,200 pounds per square inch. If you rapidly open the valve, the shock may damage the regulator. So just crack the valve until you see the pressure build up and the needle stop moving. At this point, screw the valve all the way open. The valve on the oxygen has a seat on the top as well as the bottom. This prevents leakage around the valve stem when the valve is all the way open. So make sure you screw it all the way open. Use the same procedure with the acetylene cylinder. First, inspect the cylinder valve. Get in position so that the opening points away from you. Crack the cylinder valve for just a second to blow it out. Then install the regulator. Second, be sure the adjusting screw is backed out until there is no pressure on the diaphragm. Third, stand to one side. And fourth, 
slowly crack the valve until the pressure builds up on the gauge. But there is an important difference. Unlike the oxygen valve that is completely open, the valve on the acetylene tank should only be opened one quarter to one half turn. In case of a flashback, you don't have time to close a fully open valve. So only open the acetylene valve one quarter to one half turn. When you finish mounting the regulators, take time to inspect the hoses for damage or wear and make sure all fittings are tight. Since a loose fitting could let gas escape, check the fitting between the tank and the regulators, the regulators and the hose, the hose and the flash arrester, and the flash arrester and the torque. And don't forget to make sure the screw-on tips are secure. Rule number five, do not use compressed acetylene in a free state at pressures higher than 15 pounds per square inch. Acetylene is a man-made gas, and it's very unstable. According to chemists, acetylene can be handled safely in the pressure range of 0 to 15 pounds per square inch with normal precautions. However, above 15 pounds per square inch, acetylene is likely to explode by itself. 7 pounds per square inch of acetylene pressure is all that is needed to cut 14-inch steel, and most of us don't cut metal that thick. While acetylene is safe up to 15 pounds per square inch, it is a rare situation which requires more than 10 pounds per square inch. If you are operating up in the 15 pounds per square inch range for normal work, you are first of all wasting gas, and second and most important, you may be putting yourself in a dangerous situation. Rule number six, purge your oxygen and acetylene gas passages individually before lighting the torch. It really doesn't make any difference which you purge first, but it is a good practice to have a routine. We'll start by purging the oxygen first. Check to see that the acetylene valve on the torch is closed. Open the oxygen valve and adjust the regulator to the correct operating pressure setting while the oxygen is flowing. Shut the oxygen valve off and repeat the procedure for the acetylene. This routine does two things. First, you get rid of any foreign gas that may be in either of the regulators. And second, you set your regulator pressure while the gas is actually flowing. Rule number seven, light the acetylene before opening the oxygen valve on the torch. Most operators don't like to light the acetylene first because of the slight amount of black soot created. However, this is the correct way. It is important to form the habit of lighting the acetylene first and then opening up enough oxygen to get a neutral flame. Always use a friction lighter because you are likely to burn yourself trying to light the torch with a match or other lighter. Open the acetylene valve until the flame stands away from the tip before it starts to flare out. This will reduce the black smoke to a minimum. If you don't open the acetylene valve this much, you will get more smoke and it will be burning inside the tip which could result in a flashback. Next, open the oxygen valve on the torch and adjust it for a neutral flame. A neutral flame is one where there is neither excess of oxygen nor acetylene. When this is true, there will be a little inner flame surrounded by a barely visible envelope of flame. Meet Harry, a maintenance man with 20 years of experience. Harry considers himself an expert with this equipment, but Harry has a problem. He doesn't realize the importance of rule number seven. Harry has been working several hours when lunchtime rolls around. So he turns off the valves, lays the torch down, and goes out to the lunchroom to eat. While Harry is at lunch, George needs to use the equipment. George is a maintenance man, just like Harry, with about 15 years experience. George doesn't use the equipment as much as Harry, but he does recognize that he will need a cutting head on the torch. So he takes the torch apart and installs the cutting head. He lights the torch, but when he tries to cut, he finds out right away that he doesn't have enough oxygen pressure to do the job. He has a pretty good heating flame, but it won't cut a thing, so he shuts it down. Like Harry, George likes to take shortcuts, too. He never uses a chart to determine what the proper oxygen pressure should be for a certain size tip. He just goes over to the regulator and cranks it down until it reads about 50. He mashes on the torch lever and hears the oxygen whistle and figures it's about right. George lights the torch and does his job. When he's finished, George replaces the cutting head and leaves the equipment like he found it. When he returns from lunch, Harry doesn't look at his gauges. He uses his standard shortcut. 
Since he doesn't like the black smoke you get when you light the acetylene first, Harry always cracks the oxygen valve on the torch before lighting the acetylene. Let's replay that action, except this time, keep an eye on the acetylene gauge. Notice what happens when Harry opens the oxygen valve on the torch. The pressure rises, which means that the 50 pounds pressure of oxygen, even though it was flowing out of the tip, overcame the five pounds per square inch acetylene pressure in the mixing chamber and caused a reverse flow in the acetylene line. If the check valves hold, Harry would be okay. But if the check valve on the acetylene hose leaks or is stuck open, there would be a mixture of oxygen and acetylene in the acetylene line and in the diaphragm area of the regulator. If Harry lit the torch, since an oxyacetylene mixture flashes back at approximately 24 feet per second, in about two seconds, this regulator would blow up. If Harry had remembered rule number seven and lit the acetylene first and then opened the oxygen valve until he had a neutral flame, the oxygen valve on the torch would have reduced the pressure enough to keep oxygen from flowing back into the acetylene and thus would have prevented an explosion. Here we have three balloons. The green one is filled with oxygen, the yellow one with acetylene, and the red one with a mixture of the two. When the flame of a torch touches the green balloon, the oxygen helps the rubber to burn quickly, but oxygen doesn't burn by itself. The acetylene burns with a puff. Since the 22% oxygen in the air isn't enough to burn all the acetylene, part is converted to carbon, which made the puff of smoke. Finally, the red balloon. Because of the limitations of the sound equipment, this may not sound like much of an explosion to you, but it will make your ears ring for 10 minutes. Remember that a regulator would hold several times this much because the gas is under pressure. You see what just a little of the mixture of oxygen and acetylene can do, so don't take chances. Rule number eight, never use oil on regulators, torches, fittings, or other equipment in contact with oxygen. Oil in contact with oxygen can burst into flames with no spark at all. So never put oil or grease anywhere on gas welding equipment. If you put your welding regulators or torches into a toolbox, be sure that there aren't greasy fittings or greasy rags in there. If you should get some oil or grease in a regulator, don't try to clean it yourself. Send it back to your supplier for service. Don't weld or handle gas welding equipment with greasy hands. A greasy hand in a blast of oxygen can make a gruesome torch. Rule number nine, do not use oxygen as a substitute for air. Some old timers may say, get me a tank of air, when they really mean, get me a tank of oxygen. While they know what they mean, a new helper may not understand and may think it is actually air in the tank. If oxygen were used for spraying paint, for example, there would be a danger of fire or explosion. So get in the habit of calling oxygen, oxygen, not air. Always look at the name of the gas that is in the cylinder. It is always printed right near the valve. Don't trust the color of the bottle. Rule number 10, keep your work area clean of anything that will burn. When you have your glasses on, a spark could start a fire behind you and might get out of control before you noticed what was happening. Sparks have been known to travel as much as 35 feet from the work area during the burning process. Make sure you have the proper fire extinguisher nearby. That covers the 10 main rules, but there are a few more we need to briefly mention. One of the most obvious is always wear eye protection. You could actually do gas welding or cutting without special glasses, but if you did, you will probably be blind from splatter or spark getting in your eye or suffer permanent damage from infrared or ultraviolet radiation. Compressed gas cylinders should only be stored in designated areas that are dry, well ventilated, and protected. Cylinders should be upright, have their protective caps in place, and be securely fastened. Fuel gas and oxygen should not be stored side by side. When moving or transporting cylinders, check to make sure that the valve protection cap is in place. Never use the cap to pick up a cylinder. Cylinder hand trucks are the preferred way of transporting compressed gas cylinders. A proper cylinder hand truck, chains, steadying device, or other special carrier should also be used to keep cylinders from being knocked over while in use. Make sure the cylinder is secured before the protective cap is removed. Never use a regulator designed for one type of gas on a different type of gas. Never try to use gas from a cylinder without a regulator. 
Always close the valve on empty cylinders. This prevents dirt and moisture from entering the tank. A cylinder holding a compressed gas should never be subjected to a temperature more than 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Now let's take a closer look at that fatal accident that occurred in Charlotte, North Carolina, when a man failed to follow the rules. The man was out on a job doing some cutting. A normal gauge setting for this job would be five pounds on the acetylene gauge and 40 on the oxygen gauge. After a while, he ran out of oxygen. As soon as he realized what was happening, he cut off the acetylene at the torque. But note, this is mistake number one. He didn't cut off the oxygen valve on the torque. Next, he went over and took the regulator off the oxygen tank, but he made mistake number two. He didn't screw out on the regulator adjustment to shut the regulator off. If he thought about it at all, he may have thought it was already set, so why mess with it? Anyway, he just took the regulator off the tank and laid it down. After he got another cylinder of oxygen, he put the regulator on the new tank, but still without shutting the regulator off. Before resuming the job, he took a break and didn't open the valve on the oxygen tank. When he came back, he forgot he hadn't turned the oxygen on, so he went over to his torch and made mistake number three. He didn't purge the line. If he had, he would have realized that he didn't have any oxygen pressure and that he had forgotten to close the oxygen valve on his torch. Instead, he turned the acetylene on and lit it, but couldn't get a neutral flame because he had no oxygen pressure. At this point, he realized he had forgotten to open the valve on the oxygen tank, so he shut off the oxygen and acetylene valve on the torque. Let's look at what happened up to this point. When the acetylene valve on the torch was opened, acetylene went into the mixing chamber, and part of it went out the tip to be burned. Since the acetylene had five pounds per square inch, and there was no oxygen pressure, acetylene backed up on the oxygen side. Since the oxygen valve on the torch was open, it went right on back to the check valve. What the man had no way of knowing was that a bit of grit had gotten into the system and the check valve was stuck open. So the acetylene went right on past the check valve and into the hose and back to and through the oxygen regulator. Remember, he hadn't shut off the regulator. After lighting the torch, he realized he had no oxygen pressure, so he cut off the oxygen valve at the torch. At this point, he literally created a bomb. Acetylene is all the way back to the valve on the oxygen cylinder and is now trapped there. So he made his fourth mistake. He went over and stood in front of the regulator. And then he made his fifth and last mistake. He quickly opened up the valve on the oxygen cylinder. The 2,200 pounds per square inch pressure in the oxygen cylinder slammed toward the regulator and started compressing the acetylene. When the acetylene got to some point above 32 pounds per square inch, it exploded. The explosion burned the man rather badly, but that didn't really make any difference because the adjusting screw on the regulator had already killed him. Remember, he was standing in front of it. You should remember the rules. It's your life we're talking about. Follow the rules. Here they are again. Number one, blow out the valve on the cylinder, but point it away from yourself. Number two, Release the adjusting screw on the regulator before opening the valve on the cylinder. If you back out this screw which closes off the regulator, you will greatly reduce your chances of having an explosion. Number three, when you make that adjustment to the regulator, stand to one side. If that regulator should blow, it would be bad enough to get a burned hand, but it sure would be better than getting killed. Number four, open the cylinder valve slowly. After making all the other mistakes, the man who was killed might not have had an explosion if he had opened the oxygen slowly. Number five, do not use or compress acetylene gas in a free state to pressures more than 15 pounds per square inch. It becomes unstable above that pressure. Number six, purge your oxygen and acetylene lines individually before lighting the torch. This cleans out any mixture which may be in the hose or regulator. Number seven, Always light the acetylene before opening the oxygen valve. A little soot is nothing compared to an explosion. Number eight, never use oil or grease on regulators, torches, fittings, or other equipment in contact with oxygen. Be careful where you lay that regulator when you take it off the cylinder. Number nine, never use oxygen as a substitute for compressed air. Number 10, keep heat, 
flame and sparks away from combustible. If you will follow these rules, you will greatly reduce the chances of an accident. If there is a question, check with your supervisor or team leader because special equipment frequently requires special precautions.